This is Chad Huntley. Since the birth of the United States, the sites that surround us have changed immeasurably. Weather-beaten mud paths have turned into vast highway systems. A Pony Express rider has been replaced with telephone wipes, and small flames that used to light our way have turned into electric giants. Perhaps less noticed but just as significant, the sounds of our country have changed as well. Town criers' voices have been replaced by the sharp hit of a newspaper against a back door. The hoofbeats of horses have been changed into motors and horns. And the sound of an aircraft engine is now a jet whine. The producers of this report, in cooperation with headquarters, United Air Force, and the Strategic Air Command, want you to know a new sound. What causes it? what it can and cannot do, and why it will be necessary for certain populated areas to live with it. For unless we learn to live with it, we may not live at all. This is the geographical center of the continental United States, known as the Great Plains area. Here near Omaha, in the seemingly illogical surroundings of miles of farmland, is the headquarters of a major deterrent strength of this country. Headquarters Strategic Air Command, the organization responsible for implementing the philosophy, the policy of deterrence. As the book says, the mission of the Strategic Air Command is to be prepared to conduct strategic air operations on a global basis, so that in the event of sudden aggression, SAC could immediately mount simultaneous nuclear attacks designed to destroy the vital elements of the aggressor's war-making capability to the extent that he would no longer have the will nor ability to wage war. From this headquarters building near Omaha, Nebraska, the Commander-in-Chief can order SAC's combat-ready alert bombers into the air in a matter of seconds. 24 hours a day, every day, from SAC bases throughout the world, from the North American Air Defense Command, information is fed into the control center to be correlated on these panels, information vital to the direction of the strike force. Already charted on the panels behind the drapes are SAC's emergency war plans. Plans detailing each target for every plane, every missile in the SAC arsenal. Should war ever come, the curtains would be drawn aside. In a matter of moments, the control center would be sealed off in fighting configuration. of the red telephone is picked up, every SAC base in the world could hear the words that would signal an alert, and the most powerful strike force that has ever been seen would be unleashed. The gold telephone is in readiness for only one phone call, to relay the most vital order from the President of the United States to the Commander-in-Chief of SAC. Skybird, this is Dropkick to all stations. All stations acknowledge at the count of five. One, two, three, four, and five. This is Dropkick releasing the alerting system.
Each day and night, the Strategic Air Command continues to rehearse for a mission it hopes it will never be called upon to perform. The rehearsals directed in this underground room go on all over the United States. Most of the time, our country is unaware of these rehearsals. They don't interfere with our normal everyday way of life, but occasionally, this is not true. We become very much aware that we are engaged in the new art of deterrent defense. But this sound, which can be louder than thunder, is only a pin dropping compared to a possible alternative. In this hideous cloud is a revolution in military strategy, an entirely new philosophy of international relations. Standing in awe before it, free men realize that the secret of this incredible new weapon could not be held for long that soon the arsenals of governments dedicated to world domination would be stockpiled with bombs that would make this one look like a firecracker. And they knew then that to protect themselves from the bomb and from the ambition of totalitarian states, they must build a military striking force so strong that to provoke it would be suicidal. And so the strategy of deterrence was born. through the foreseeable future, SAC will be equipped with planes as well as missiles. At present, more than one half dozen different types of missiles have been integrated into the SAC arsenal, with more to be added as rapidly as they become operationally reliable. The first intercontinental ballistic missile to take its place in the deterrent force is the Atlas. But missiles are not yet available in sufficient quantities to be more than an adjunct to the deterrent force. And there is another problem. In the event of a surprise attack launched against us, the long-range radar of our early warning system might give us no more than 15 minutes warning. In those 15 minutes, we would have to get our retaliatory strike force in the air or face the possibility of having it wiped out on the ground. If our deterrent force consisted solely of missiles, every ready weapon would have to be launched at once. But the problem is that at the present time, our high-frequency, long-range radar is still subject to many bugs, electronic disturbances, interference from other radar installations. Even flights of birds can create patterns on the radar screen that could be mistaken for an attacking force. Checking and rechecking could well use up those precious 15 minutes. As long as there is any doubt, we dare not launch our missiles. For once fired and on its way to target, an ICBM cannot be called back. Bombers can. The newest manned weapon in SAC's arsenal to maintain the peace is the supersonic Delta Wing B-58 Hustler jet bomber. In one jump, the B-58 built by the Convair Division of General Dynamics, powered by General Electric J-79 turbojet engines, has outstripped the past 50 years of aviation history. Its top speed is as much faster than the speediest previous bomber as that plane was faster than the Wright brothers' original flying machine. A 
philosophy, an organization, modern weapons, and then men. Trained men to fly these weapon systems, trained by practice of bombing missions without bombs. Directed by SAC, a practice bombing mission, one of thousands, is to be sent from Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, where the top flight SAC bomber crews are undergoing training. Do you, you get the Excel points? Okay, acceleration. This crew has almost completed its indoctrination course in the B-58 Hustler. Only a few blanks remain to be filled out on their performance record charts before they will be qualified as a combat-ready crew in the free world's fastest bomber. They are the aircraft commander and pilot, Major Joseph E. Briggs, age 38, 14 years with the Air Force, married, four children. Defensive systems officer, Captain William H. Scanlon, age 31, 10 years in the Air Force, married, three children. We can expect fighter attacks immediately. Navigator, Captain Walter C. Lyles, age 30, six years in the Air Force, married, one child. HR control line. Each SAC training mission is planned with painstaking care. For every hour they will spend in the air, one and one half hours have been spent in preparation on the ground. Each mile is literally flown on paper before it's flown in the sky. They say in SAC that you're not ready to take off until the weight of the paper equals the weight of the aircraft. This will be a radar bombing. The target, a long range one, routed over 3,000 miles away. The center of the village square, Deerfield, Massachusetts. Ironically, Deerfield, which is a quiet New England village, has a history of hearing the sounds of freedom's battles. And the memory of those sounds has been preserved in a memorial. One morning in 1704, 50 of Deerfield's residents were killed and hundreds taken away as prisoners. Half the city was burned to the ground. Again, in our country's revolution, and in the ensuing years, Deerfield heard the sounds necessary to protect their freedom. Now, Deerfield had been chosen again. This time, there would be no battle attack, no fires, no explosions, but there would be a sound, a sound of protection loud enough to be heard by every resident in the village. Deerfield had not been chosen arbitrarily. This city, along with many other radar bomb sites or targets in the United States, was carefully selected because the pattern it makes in the plane's radar scope is similar to that of an actual target in potential enemy territory. The relation of the buildings, the hills and the houses, even the memorial of Deerfield creates a similar radar pattern to a possible enemy target city. The bomb they drop on the American target is a harmless electronic beam. It would, of course, be something else if they were flying in anger to a target beyond our borders. To reach their radar bomb scoring site targets, the SAC crews fly a roundabout course over the United States of several thousand miles to approximate the distance to their actual target. During the latter stages of the flight, they may engage in evasive tactics against U.S. fighter planes of our Air Defense Command testing their ability to penetrate any possible enemy defense. Refueling to the south tip of Coates Island, then on up north, back to Coates Island, to our HR control line, our start acceleration point, to our turn point on Lake Huron, to our IP in Lake Ontario, to Target Echo Deerfield, to our turn point, Nashville, Tennessee, Carswell, let down and land. Okay, well, let me check it one more time. The axis of attack, 117 degrees, Mach 2 at 40,000 feet. Do we have the RBS time? Roger, our control time is 0800. Bill, what's our fuel reserve going to be? Uh, we should have 11,000 pounds fuel reserve, provided our wind predictions hold. Good. Okay, we have the rendezvous, refueling, ECM, gunnery, bomb run, navigation legs, and then home. That should make it complete. Let's go and check the airplane. Their flight plan has been filed. 
They've been assigned the code word Tall Man 55 for identification. They've picked up the up to the hour wind and weather reports, purchased their box lunch suppers, and are on their way to their target. This is Navigator. Your initial heading, 337 Magnetic. Thanks. On the outskirts of Deerfield, on a vacant lot, is a radar system mounted on top of two adjoining trailers. Inside one of the trailers is a small dark radar room waiting for the telltale blip on a scope, which means the aircraft is approaching. In the other trailer is a group waiting to communicate with Tall Man 55, as well as track the plane as it enters the target area. Acceleration point, 600 miles to target. Start acceleration, 30 seconds. Roger, Walt. Start acceleration checkpoint. 600 miles out at 0722. Let's get it in high gear. Uh, Roger, acceleration checkpoint. Uh, third station going on oxygen. fastest bomber accelerates steadily to Mach 2, twice the speed of sound, for its final 600-mile dash to the target, creating and dragging with it a thunderclap of sound. Like all sound, this sonic boom results from an invisible pressure wave. Below Mach 1, the speed of sound, they push aside the molecules just ahead, and they, in turn, give warning and push aside the molecules ahead of them. But at the exact speed of sound, these molecules can no longer react quickly enough. The leading edges are among them before they can move aside. And the molecules pile up in a so-called shock wave of energy. At precisely Mach 1, if they were visible, spreading out in all directions, they might resemble a shallow dish attached to the plane. But as the plane speed increases, the pressure wave sweeps back at an angle, forming a funnel-shaped cone trailing back from the plane. And of course, a portion of this funnel of pressure reaches the ground. But when pressure of varying intensity and wavelength strikes the ear, we perceive it as sound. Therefore, anyone along the path of the cone of overpressure hears a sharp report similar to a thunderclap at the instant the cone passes. There is the question of damage. In exhaustive tests conducted by structural engineers, even the flimsiest of buildings have remained unharmed through overpressures more than nine times greater than the probable boom. 
However, some windows may be broken, particularly if the glass is already under stress. When the boom does strike the ground, no one will try to tell you it's a pretty sound. But it is a comforting one. It's the sound of your Air Force at work. Bill, this is Navigator. We're approaching the initial point. 100 miles out. Better contact, bomb plot. Uh, Deerfield, the bomb plot. This is Tallman 5-5. Five five. Over. Tallman 5-5, five five. this is Deerfield, bomb plot. Go ahead, please. Score by tone. Run type Romeo 4. Crew Sierra 05. Navigator Lyles. I spell Lima Yankee. Lima, Echo, Sierra, Frank, Captain, over. Hi, Roger, I copy you, Tollman 55 at 40,000, a B-58 type aircraft, requesting a Romeo 4 run on target. Echo, can I be of Long Meadow, crew number is Sierra 05. Operator's name, Lyles, I spell Lima, Yankee, Lima, Echo, Sierra. He is a captain, is that affirmative, please, over. Uh, Roger, 55, is affirmative. Roger, 55, over. Roger, 5-5. Radar, we have an aircraft at 40,000 feet over Long Meadow. Good aircraft, supersonic, tracking 117. Man, is this guy really coming in? Navigator, this is Defense Systems Operator. We're cleared for target. Bomb run checklist complete. I have the target on scope now. 300 seconds to go till bomb's away. Over. Deerfield bomb plot, 1-6. This is Tallman 5-5. Five five. Five zero miles. Make this the final, or we're coming too fast for a two five mile check. The one one seven zero is as briefed. Over. Roger five five. Over. One hundred and twenty seconds. Check in second station. Locked in by radar to these sensitive instruments, the precise course of the plane is charted until the instant when their harmless electronic bomb is released upon the target. Twenty seconds, turn on. Did they make it? Probably so. They usually do. But deterrence is a perishable thing. It must be worked at constantly. In this business, there isn't much difference between self-satisfaction and surrender. If you can fly Mach 2 today, how fast can you fly tomorrow? If you hit the pickle barrel today, how about the pickle tomorrow? They'll be back tomorrow to see. Deterrence is a philosophy. Keep the peace by being strong enough to destroy the attacker. Deterrence is a bomb and a vehicle to deliver it. Deterrence is trained men. But the most important of all ingredients in the deterrent concept is the one provided by the people, the will. The will behind the concept. A public will to use the bomb and the vehicle, if it comes to that, to preserve a thing we call human dignity. For the enemy will not be deterred by all the planes, missiles, bombs, and men in the world 
if he thinks we are lacking in the will to use them. Sonic booms are a nuisance. The men who make them know it and regret it as much as anyone. But to accept them as one of the necessary costs of being free is perhaps the very best way of demonstrating to the enemy our intention of remaining that way. As long as our planes are in the sky and not on the ground, as long as the boom continues, we stand prepared. The sound of the boom has become the sound of necessity and protection. The sound of your Air Force at work. We're ready, on the alert, 24 hours a day. From the snow or desert sand, the strategic air command. This is our profession. Faster, faster than sound, up with our wings and a boom. Through new hallways in the sky, with the force none can deny. This is our profession. Awake when the sky is black, awake when the sky is blue. Our guard is the shield of sack from Cape May to Cisco U. Always ready to fly, ready to move the call. With our birds of steel at hand, the strategic air command. Peace is our.